A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment is a nonprofit organization supported entirely by your donations. If you've ever enjoyed one of our podcast episodes, community, or classes, please consider making a donation of any size right now on our website at skepticspath.org. On the website, you can also find links to purchase the book based on the podcast, How to Train a Happy Mind, or join our Train a Happy Mind community that features weekly lectures, meditations, classes, and discussions. I'm Scott Snibby, and this is A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment, where we share practical ideas from Buddhism to build happier lives, stronger relationships, and a better world. Venerable Tupton Chodron is an author, teacher, and the founder and abbess of Sravasti Abbey, one of the first Tibetan Buddhist training monasteries for Western monks and nuns in the U.S. She teaches worldwide and is known for her practical and entertaining explanations of how to apply Buddhist teachings in daily life. She's the author of many excellent books on Buddhist philosophy and meditation, and is currently co-authoring with His Holiness the Dalai Lama an extraordinary multi-volume series of teachings on the Buddhist path, the Library of Wisdom and Compassion. Several years ago, I read Venerable Tupton Chodron's book, Working with Anger, and I found it quite inspiring. A couple months ago, her schedule finally allowed time to speak with me, and we talked exclusively about anger, what it is, why it's harmful, and how we can work with anger in ways that heal relationships rather than destroy them. She touches on anger's role in some of the most challenging situations like gender bias and war protests and how we can deal with these situations courageously and skillfully. Well, Venerable Tubden Chodron, I am really in awe of the extraordinary series of books you've created with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And first of all, I want to thank you for them and all that you do for the nuns at Sravasti Abbey and your many other fantastic books, including Working with Anger, which is the one I wanted to talk to you about today for probably obvious reasons for the people listening right Okay. Now. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, my pleasure. And I wonder if you could start out by sharing the Buddhist definition of anger. Mm, okay. So it's a mental factor, yeah, and it is based on exaggerating the negative qualities of someone or something, and then responding to that by wanting to strike back or get away. Okay? So fight or flight. I don't think the flight is the part is technically in the definition, but uh, I think it needs to be added personally. <laughs> yeah, and they even say there's also... Um freezing is a response to that that people they keep adding responses there's freezing and there's also um like pleasing <laughs> you know like it's another response to stress or strain or, you know different ways of response but yeah that lashing out right is the one we know most with anger yeah but some people just because we don't lash out doesn't mean we don't have a problem with anger okay because a lot of us, I think especially women, have been told that you're not supposed to express anger. And so uh, the anger comes out in terms of, and this, go, this part I'm explaining to applies to men as well, but it comes out in terms of just withdrawing totally. You're so mad you can't talk to somebody. You just shut the other person out, shut them down. Like... For example, you know, early in my training, I didn't think I had a big problem with anger because I didn't yell and scream. Yeah, I didn't throw things. I didn't hit people. So I thought, yeah, I have a little anger, but it's not a big problem. And then Lama sent me to be the gegu of the macho Italian monks. And my big lesson there is I have a big problem with anger. You know, it was like, oh, oh, my God. You know, I am really angry. How did that anger manifest, and, um, and how did you start to counteract it? 
you know, if you're a macho Italian monk, you do not want an American woman who knows how to speak up to be the disciplinarian and tell you what to do. Okay. So anyway, everybody was supposed to come to morning practice, and uh, the monks would not show up. And I would remind them, you know, we have practice at whatever time it was. Please come. This is an instruction from our teacher. Next morning, nothing, you know, or maybe one person came. So then I had to start going into the wing where their rooms were and knocking on doors and waking them up, which is, you know, not my idea of a good time. Was like, yeah, you're not going to tell us what to do. Mm. What helped you to deal with that? I'm one of those people who shuts down and leaves the situation. So I would just, you know, walk away and I'd go back to my room and then I would pull out Shanti Deva's text, Engaging in the Bodhisattva Deeds, Chapter Six on Patience or Fortitude, How to Work with Your Anger. And I would spend most of the evening, every evening, uh, you know, going over that chapter, trying to practice the the thought training techniques that Shanti Deva taught. Uh, the next day, I'd go back into my office. Who knows what's going on? I'd get really mad, and then, uh, you know, go back to my room in the evening and and meditate on on chapter six. Can you th remember a specific example of something that made you very angry and, and an antidote that really worked? Yeah. Well, one of the things is I would sit and, and ask myself, okay, this kind of behavior that I'm experiencing from people, a total lack of respect, a total looking down on me, you know, because my pride was hurt, you know, and they were all ganging up on me too, even worse. Oh, this isn't fair. Anyway, so I would think, okay, have I ever looked down on other people? Have I ever refused to follow instructions that were just basic, reasonable things? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I've done that. Have I ever insulted people like they insulted me? Mm, yeah, I've done that. Uh, have I ever been, uh, you know, totally uncooperative and and ridiculed people? That's another thing they did. They ridiculed me in meetings. Have I ever ridiculed people and humiliated them? Yes. Well, if I've done that, why am I surprised? When other people do that to me. Hmm. And that helped you to overcome the anger in oh, those Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the, the anger is blaming the other person. The way I was thinking this thought training was, oh, I have some responsibility for this. Yeah. And also another way to deal with it is when you feel that way, you're, you're peak, you know, well, what is what are my buttons that are getting pushed? Yeah, I would have these very interesting little conversations with myself and say, you know, I'm sitting here. That's the wisdom me. This is the me that's mad. So wisdom me says, uh, okay, why are you angry? I said, well, they said this and they said that and then no, 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 no. Yes, okay, they said that, but why are you angry? Well, they did, uh, no, no, no. I repeat the same thing a few times. Okay. Finally, and they keep, the wisdom side says, yes, they did that, but why do you have to get angry? Mm. Well, they disrespected me. They ridiculed me. They made me feel bad about myself. Oh, so... You're feeling bad about yourself is their problem. The wisdom me said, 
to the afflicted me. Uh, mm, no, you know, your sensitivity about how people treat you is somebody else's problem. Uh, no, that's my problem also. Uh, what about your, your wanting praise and not criticism? Whose problem is that? Uh, well, that's my problem, too. <laughs> so it's like, okay, if I have all these buttons that, you know, are so super sensitive that all somebody has to do is just walk past them and the, the movement of the air sets off my anger, <laughs> You know, whose problem is that? That's my mm. problem of being so ego-sensitive. Yeah. And so, you know, you we cannot control other people. We keep trying, but we can't control them. And then the only thing uh, we can, you know, change is really ourselves. Mm. Well, let me ask you a question because it's that does sound you're quite good at playing your the two roles of yourself <laughs> there the the wisdom and the afflicted um, venerable Tubden children, but this is something I bet a lot of people are thinking about is the the dis, the situations you described seem to have something to do with gender bias as well. So where's the place to you know speak up and try to correct some of that you know more systematic injustice? And where's the place to be, you know, to be quiet and, and work on yourself? How do you find that balance? Well, in that particular situation, if I brought up gender bias, they would have just exploded and been even angrier because nobody likes to have anger thrown at them. So it's something that you have to say in a reasonable tone of voice. Yeah, not too forcefully not accusing them, because if you're talking to men, they're a bit sensitive, although they would never admit it. Uh, well, it's true. There's it's a monk true. sitting over here. I'm yeah. checking even it if, out with Even him. if you're a monk. Even, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so in the, the thing of gender bias, I think it's really helpful when men say things to other men, because a man will listen to another man about it. If a woman talks about it, oh, there she goes, she's complaining, she wants to be equal, we aren't respecting her, she's such a crybaby. No, you know, so it, that's why it's, it's much easier if, if men would do it. But there are occasions when, as a woman, uh, I I do something, but what I've learned is it's better to ask it as a question. As soon as you state something, that even you're stating a fact, they take it as an accusation. Then it's better. Like uh, I was at a uh, a conference last year, and I I just said, you know. I'm curious that there's so few women. Do you need some help inviting women? I can, you know, tell you some good people to invite. You know, that kind of way is is much better. At a second conference I went to, um, a man brought it up in the q and A. I was going right on, you know, because when he brought it up, I think, you know, that people would listen a little bit more. But that's just one situation about gender bias. There are many other situations um, where, you know, you're dealing with people where you can say things in a in a uh, a straighter way, or um, I should say, maybe a more direct way. And for someone who's in the throes of anger, you know, when you're completely controlled by that delusion. What do we do in that situation? You know, because um, anger is anger is a, a destructive delusion. You say right, but you also talked about the importance of accepting it. So, 
how do you do that? Tara Brock once said, you know, you don't want to tell yourself not to be angry because that just adds shame on top of anger. You know, that that leads to this question about being angry at yourself, <laughs> though, right? When you have self-criticism, self-judgment, um, how do we deal with that sort of anger? Okay. That is a big, big problem in the West. I was at one of the Mind and Life conferences way back, like 1989 or, uh, no, somewhere in the 90s, you know. This uh, idea of Westerners having low self-esteem came up. And His Holiness Dalai Lama was totally puzzled by it. And he looked around the room, and here are all these high-powered scientists, okay, who have PhDs and positions at universities and you know, na, 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 na. and his holiness says, who has this self-hatred, this lack of esteem for yourself? And everybody looks around and says, oh, well, we all do. Mm. And his holiness was shocked. Right? And his next question was, why don't you like yourselves? Why are you mad at yourselves? Why do you put yourselves down? And then that began really interesting brainstorming sessions. So we came up with all sorts of theories, you know, ranging from being taught original sin when you're a little kid to the fact that starting very young, you get ranked with other kids. You know, who can kick the ball furthest? Who got a gold star for being good? Always being trained to, I want to stick out. And the more hooked we are on getting praise and approval from external, you know, the more we judge ourselves and say, oh, I didn't, somebody else got two gold stars in kindergarten, and I only got one, and my parents want me to be the best one in class, and I'm not. And, you know, just that whole thing of starting very young, mm. um, having to be an individual and make ourselves known. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, that it, makes a it lot just, of sense. Yeah brings a lot of self-criticism, a lot of self-judgment. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is if we listen to ourself, our self-talk, when we're mad at ourselves, what kind of things do you say? I can't do anything right. No wonder nobody likes me. No wonder nobody loves me. Everything I do ends in a mess. Okay, so you get the flavor of mm -hmm, that's the mm -hmm. way, yeah. So what words do we hear in that? Always, never, no one else, only me. Yeah, so if we look at the language, there's very extreme statements. I can't do anything right. Really? You can't do anything right? I mean, you can make a cup of tea. There's so many things that we know how to do. How can we say, I can't do anything right? Yeah. That is not true. That is a big, fat lie. There's many things that we can do well. Okay. Nobody loves me. Nobody? Come on. That is definitely not true. You know, I mean, there are other human beings who care about you. And if you have a dog or a cat or a pet pig, they love you too. <laughs> yeah, that's why people love their pets, right? Pets never hurt your feelings. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And can you talk about, like, let's talk about more extreme types of anger where, like, in the case of serious abuse or mistreatment, like, what are the ways to to process that and um, get out of the 
other hatred, the self hatred. Um, like what? What are the techniques? Okay. You know, to pass through that grief, you know, things like that. Okay. So here I'm speaking from a Buddhist um, perspective. Some people, you know, find therapy really helpful. So you know, if you want therapy, if you need therapy, go to a good therapist. You know. Um, but some ways to handle that. First of all, to realize if things happen when you were quite young, you know, it's like I was a child. I don't understand how the world works. And, you know, this person did that. And kids tend to blame themselves for things. Yeah. I had one friend who was uh, getting divorced and her son said, I know why dad's leaving. It's because I'm bad. Oh, I cringed when I heard that, you know? So if you're doing that to realize, wait a minute, I was a kid when that happened. I had no idea what was going on. And so I developed this totally wrong idea that this was my fault. It's not my fault. You know, what this person did was wrong. Yeah. Okay. So that helps with the the self blame, mm -hmm. the self hatred. But how to get over the anger at the other person? Well, you know, oh, they did X Y Z. That seemed to make them happy. Uh, were they happy before? Were they really happy afterwards? If a person is happy do they wake up in the morning and feel and say the sun is shining things are going well in my life i'm so happy i think i'm going to go abuse somebody okay so then the person who did that who harmed me was an unhappy person yeah and if you know anything about that person's life Think about their life, what happened in their family, what happened in their culture, or if they faced oppression or discrimination or poverty or whatever. And think of, of their life, and it's like, yeah, that person was really unhappy. And in their pain, they thought that harming me was going to relieve their own stress and their own tension and make them happy. And that's a wrong conception, you know, on their part. That isn't going to make them happy. Why do people do this? So even though they do these things because their wish is to be happy, because they don't know what the actual causes of happiness are, they act in this totally, you know, harmful, sometimes despicable way. And what they're really saying is, I'm suffering. Well, suffering people, um, they're the objects of my compassion, not the objects of my hatred. Yeah, so, so the antidote for anger toward the person who harmed you the most is compassion, which is can be hard to hear. Can be hard to hear, but it um, it oh, but works. It works, but you have to remember, compassion does not mean what the other person did was okay. It does not mean that what they did was good. What they did was not good. It was not okay. Yeah, they created negative karma. Then they harm themselves. They harm somebody else. Yeah, but. Just because what they did to me was not okay, that doesn't mean I have to hold a grudge and trap myself in hatred towards them for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, very, that's very wise. And let's talk about another difficult situation, which is what's the role of anger in social change? When you speak out of anger, uh, people don't listen. You know, they say, oh, there's an angry person, and this is what they're angry about. But does it change anybody else's mind? 
No. Yeah. Of course, protesters don't like to hear that. But this is, you know, I protested the Vietnam War when I when I was in college. And, you know, this is the one of the conclusions I came to is, you know, if you're angry, you may feel good and have a lot of energy and you dump it out. And I'm communicating. Well, communication isn't just me getting what I'm feeling out. Communicating is thinking of who my audience is and how can I say something in a way that will really help that person understand something different from how they're looking at the situation now. You can talk to the people who walk by without screaming, without looking down at them, without telling them they're wrong. You can smile at, at the, the people who walk by. You know, there's a whole different feeling. But when I try and say that, the protesters get so mad at me. You know, it's like, because what I'm trying to do is comment on the way of protesting. Because what happens mostly when you're protesting is I'm here, they're there, I'm right, they are wrong, what they're doing is awful, they're completely closed-minded, they're completely idiotic, I've got to yell and scream at them, and that way they will understand and change. Oh, really? Uh, no. It doesn't, you know? Yeah, has that worked? Yeah, that that's not going to work. I mean, I saw that very clearly during a Vietnam War protest I was in at UCLA, and the guy next to me, we were on one side, the cops were on the other side. The guy next to me picked up a rock or a brick or something and threw it at the cops, and I went, whoa. You know, because when you do that, your mind becomes exactly like the mind of the people you're protesting. Yeah? The state of mind is the same. The only difference is I'm protesting you and you're protesting me and calling you names. But it doesn't change minds. Uh, yesterday, I was giving another talk, and I uh, commented about that. Um, you know, in terms of the college protests that are going on now. Well, somebody was one somebody was furious at me and wrote an email saying, you know, it was so interesting because the email was this person, the way they were writing, it was if they understood exactly what I meant and exactly how my own mind worked. You know, you are biased. You, you don't care at all about these people. Uh, you know, don't you see what is going on and why aren't you condemning that? You know, mm -hmm. they wanted me to talk about the situation that's happening in another part in the world I was talking about the college protests, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so they understood that as me, crit me not siding with them mm -hmm. against what they were protesting, you know? When actually, I share the, the same feeling. But the difference, I think, is that because of of the, the Buddhist training, I don't see it as this side versus that side. When you're a speaker, you get used to sometimes people misinterpreting what you say and getting mm -hmm. mad. And, you know, and and then I'm also I also try and angry when I get these emails that where people don't like what I'm saying. Um, um to to just say well, that's okay. It's a free world. Everybody is entitled to their own ideas, and um, not the whole world doesn't need to uh, agree with me. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you weigh that with um, the compassion, with justice, accountability? You know, again, what's the balance? Okay. First of all, the word justice, I don't know about that. I have never heard a, one of any of my Tibetan teachers use that word. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never... Yeah, but it's quite... We hear it a lot today. Yeah. <laughs> But I've never heard a Tibetan teacher, a Buddhist teacher, use the word justice. Okay? So that's one thing. So what does justice mean? Well, if the Buddhists don't talk about it, what's our first thought about justice? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And as Gandhi said, then the whole world's going to be blind and nobody's going to be able to chew their food. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I'll tell you once, I was teaching in Israel. You know, there was some Buddhist groups there, and they had invited me. And at one time, it was a retreat situation. We were talking about anger, and I led a meditation about uh, forgiveness. If you live in Israel, the Holocaust actually ended with the Second World War, But in the minds of people, the Holocaust is alive. Mm -hmm. And this is, by the way, you know, feeding what's going on in Israel right now is they feel like they are fighting simply to exist. So I led this meditation where we uh, imagined going into Auschwitz and Imagining everything, you know, being channeled and divided into groups, separating from loved ones, you know, then living in the the wooden dormitories and everything, smelling the uh, crematorium all day long, being harassed by guards, hearing the sound of the of bullets and the firing squad, and so on. And we we spend some time in this meditation. Uh, imagining that uh, Chenrezig, the Buddha of Compassion, was at our heart. And in each of these situations, you know, we would imagine the situation and Chenrezig being there, radiating compassion to everybody in the situation. Mm-hmm. So not just the, the prisoners in Auschwitz, but the guards. Yeah, the Nazi... Uh, administrators and, you know, do, radiating compassion to, to everybody in the situation. So we did that there. Then we did it, you know, going into the, um, the, the gas chambers, you know, and Chen Rezi's there and radiating compassion to all the people who are have no clue what's going on in their lives. Well, because they're dying and why, you know? And again, to the people who were running the gas chamber, can you imagine? I mean, how those people must feel, and then the people who have to go through it afterwards and pick the gold out of people's teeth and mm. cut their hair, that they use the hair to stuff the jackets. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, anyway, so... It was quite a meditation going through everything and continually compassion, compassion, compassion. Mm. And, the you know, Chinrezi's compassionate white light filling that whole space. It was a very, very powerful meditation, you know. Mm. And I think for, because it, there it's a whole culture that's traumatized. Even they weren't alive during the time of the Holocaust, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it passes down. Yeah. Hmm. And so what happened? How did people respond? I can imagine, you know, some people potentially not responding that well to that meditation if they're not ready for it. How did it go in the center? It went very well. I mean, it was people, they've been at a Buddhist retreat for some time. So it wasn't, we didn't do this on the first day. But but it nobody had problems with it. I mean, in terms of like, uh, you know, it was it affected people quite deeply, mm. but um, not in well, a negative way. 
that's quite hopeful because if if um you know descendants of Holocaust uh, people who were in, who died in the Holocaust could do that, then probably today um, people on both sides of these conflicts, it's possible. So Venerable Tuvtin Chodron, it's a, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about such an important and timely topic as anger. And so frankly and honestly, you know the the Buddhist approach is is quite um, powerfully blunt, <laughs> direct sometimes. And I really appreciate your candor, um, even though it might upset some people, you know, it's like the, the, this wisdom can be hard. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. And I really appreciate your time doing the interview with us. Please continue all your beneficial activities and however many more dozens of volumes of your series with His Holiness. Uh, <laughs> you know, about being very straightforward, yeah. you know, um, this is the, why I so much appreciate the Buddha's teachings and Shanti Deva's teachings. My mind is so skilled at justifying, rationalizing, suppressing, repressing, excusing everything I don't like. That it, you know, Shanti Deva, the candor stopped me in my tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to deal with my own problems. And stop yeah, a, blaming other people. The famous quote, right? You can um, pave the world with leather or you can put on a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I remember that every day, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Yeah, thanks. sure. Okay. Thanks for joining us for my conversation with Venerable Tupton Chodron. If you enjoyed this episode, you might enjoy my book based on our podcast's modern approach to Buddhist wisdom, How to Train a Happy Mind. You can get the book in paper, ebook, and audiobook format anywhere you buy books. It even just came out in German. If you'd like to go deeper in your meditation practice, on our website you can sign up for our newsletter and join our Train a Happy Mind community that offers weekly lectures, meditations, classes, and discussions. Please also consider making a donation to our podcast if you have the means. A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment is a nonprofit organization. Our podcasts and programs are free and ad-free thanks to our generous donors. To support us now, visit our website at skepticspath.org. We accept cash, credit, Bitcoin, and other cryptocurrencies, and your donations are tax-deductible in the U.S. Thanks to Annie Nguyen for production and story editing, Christian Parry for mastering, and Isabella Asibal for marketing. We wish you a wonderful day.